So, look, thank you for the, the invitation and also for the expert uh, PowerPoint support. Um, I, I'll just jump right into it. So I, my background is that I'm, I'm, uh, I work in Brazil. Um, I used to work in Geneva, uh, helped set up an organization called the Small Arms Survey. Um, and since then, I've been working, teaching at Oxford and Graduate Institute and also in the States and now in Brazil. Um, and I've spent the last couple of decades working in war and uh, crime-affected countries in Africa and Asia and the Americas. And I've been, throughout these last couple, I guess two decades, I'm not that old, um, I've been interested in learning about not just the dynamics uh, of, of violence and or collective and interpersonal violence, but also ways to prevent and reduce uh, violence. Um, and most recently, I've planted myself in Brazil where uh, it's actually the world's violence capital in some respects. It's got more homicides than any other country on the planet, 56,000 a year. Um, and violence is the leading cause of death for young men under 30. All kinds of death. Um, and so I've done a lot of household surveys and, and, and research work in all of these continents, including in Brazil, uh, in the country of Brazil, on issues around victimization, uh, violence, uh, I've done lots of verbal autopsies, uh, but also looking increasingly at the police justice penal system. But I started working on cities and urban violence about eight or nine years ago. Um, and I was curious, it was really motivated just by a, a, a general, I'm not an urbanist, I'm not a geographer, I'm trained as a development economist and a political scientist. And I, I was curious about cities, really about how cities endured in the context of chronic and extreme violence. How, how were they resilient or not? How did their institutions bounce back? in the face of chronic violence? How did people and communities get transformed by violence? So I was interested in city as a unit of analysis, having spent a lot of time wandering around the country, countries as a whole. And during this period uh, of the last eight or nine years, um, wandering from city to city and sort of asking these questions, I, I've been uh, quite astonished about the way the geography of violence appears to be transforming. Um, it seems that it's not so much our nation states that are really gripped by conflict, crime, health pandemics, and the like, but actually our cities. So Abidjan, Baghdad, Caracas, Damascus, Kabul, violence is really clearly migrating in many cases to the city, or it's always been in the city. And I've become in the process more, I guess, convinced of the importance of cities and the spaces within cities and their neighborhoods as being central to global transformations in violence. Um, and it's sort of obvious. It's obvious the fact that most people today live in cities. Um, cities are also where we see some of the most extraordinary innovation and experimentation with social policy. Um, and I'm not the only one coming to this conclusion about the centrality of cities, obviously. I mean, even the UN high-level panel uh, for the post-2015 discussion, which we talked about this morning, uh, has noted that the fight for development and security uh, whether you define that as eradicating poverty or uh, addressing inequality will be won or lost in our cities. But when you, talk of the, when you look at the literature on cities, and this is not criminological literature, it's not public health literature, I'm, I'm talking about the urbanist and geographer, geography type literatures, um, there's often a great optimism about cities and the promise of cities in addressing things like security. People like Ed Glazer, um, Benjamin Barber, Richard Florida, who are kind of internationally recognized um, uh, urbanists, see a triumphant promise in the cities. They see creative classes in the cities. They see mayors that will one day rule the world. In fact, they're setting up networks of mayors, over 500 of them, to come together and address these kinds of intractable problems in their cities, including violence. On the other hand, you also have some pessimists when it comes to cities, uh, including among criminologists and sociologists. People like Mike Davies, Richard Kaplan, Stephen Graham. Uh, they're thinkers who see in cities sort of foreboding, um, insecurity, disasters, uh, and of course, the dreaded urban sprawl. But in looking at cities for the last sort of eight or nine years, I guess what I've been struck by is that the debate on cities and cities as centers for violence prevention reduction is largely confined to the north. That is North America, uh, Western Europe, where crime rates are at their lowest in 50 years. And if we listen to Steven Pinker, they're at their lowest in, say, several hundred years. Um, there's much less discussion in the literature or even in the policy spheres about cities in underdeveloped settings like Africa, Asia, and the Americas, which I suspect my colleagues are going to be speaking about. Um, and I think it's important to, to, to make that point right off the bat, that for every city that's arrived, for any Kuala Lumpur or for every Shanghai, there's a handful of other cities that are failing, that have literally fallen or are in the process of falling off the grid, where the social contract that binds you know, politicians and their elected officials to uh, the citizens has broken down. Recall that citizenship, 
by definition, begins in the city. And often we're seeing ruptures in that social contract. Um, and large swaths of the city, including the one that I live in today, Rio de Janeiro, are not necessarily governed at all. I mean, governance is more uh, uh, an aspiration than a reality. So I'm calling these fragile cities, for lack of a better term. I'm happy to, to, be, to entertain other, other ways of describing them. And I think that they're a challenge not just to those living in them. Um, I think they're a challenge to the countries within which they, they exist, as well as within the regions and even potentially across the world. And the problem is that fragile cities are growing. They're not getting smaller. All future population growth, virtually all future population growth, more than 90% is going to be in the south over the next 50 years, in the under, lesser and lower income countries, because Europe and North America have already gone through, in a way, their demographic transition. So we're talking about a concentration and a growth pattern that is, in, in many ways, um, barring extraordinarily dramatic intervention, inevitable. So if I go to the next slide, there are a host of micro theories and explanations for what, what, what contributes to violent crime in these cities. And, you know, as you all know, virtually most, almost all of this evidence is mobilized from North American um, and European cities like Chicago, New York, Boston, Los Angeles, but also London, Glasgow, Manchester, and elsewhere. Many of these micro-level theories focus on the city environment and the way it either induces or deters violence. So scholars like Ackerman and Mornoff and Samson argue that there are typically areas, specific locations within cities that offer more opportunities for criminal activity owing to neglect, disinterest, or the absence of state presence uh, or economic decay. There are other micro-level theories uh, that focus on individual factors as opposed to city spaces of, of the residents themselves and the ways that underlying conditions shape their criminal behavior or their non-criminal behavior. So for example, there's a very strong correlation, um, a statistical correlation between unemployment and violent crime in cities like Baltimore, Richmond, Detroit, which for all intents and purposes have very fragile areas within them. And there's still other micro-level theories that link urban violence to underlying structural conditions in the urban economy, especially poverty. So folks like Singer and Bottoms and Block and Wiles have shown how areas exhibiting higher densities of offenders, a higher percentage of rental housing, large social housing projects tend to be more violent um, than other areas. I've actually done some studies recently uh, with economists and geographers in places like Ciudad Juarez in Mexico, uh, in Port-au-Prince, in, in Haiti, uh, in Rio, obviously, also in Nairobi, on looking at how levels of social disorganization or organization influence uh, crime patterns. And so we've tried to control for a whole range of socioeconomic determinants and detected six or seven risk factors and a number of a handful of, of protective factors uh, that, that put residents at greater or lesser risk of violence. And I'm happy to talk about those. But today, I want to focus more on the macro level theories. And I, I, because I'm doing a chapeau for this talk, I was going to kind of, we were asked to think big. So I'm going to try to step back and think really big. Um, and I want to identify five, what I think are five mega trends that are going to define the trajectories of fragile cities for the next 50 years. Uh, and my argument is that I think we need to anticipate and respond to these, at the very minimum, acknowledge them, if we're going to make a serious dent on having violence by 2030. The first mega trend uh, I already alluded to is the way that the geography of violence is changing. While it's hard to believe, I think for most people in this room, it's, it is actually not that hard to believe because you've been told it so many times, but we're actually living through one of the most peaceful moments in history, uh, certainly in the last 50 years. Um, a number of social scientists, including Steven Pinker, but also there's a whole rash of others, uh, have shown how the frequency and intensity of armed conflict has actually declined quite dramatically over the last 50 years, even if we've seen a sharp uptick in Syria and Ukraine and a few other places. If you looked at a map, a graph that kind of went like this, Syria would be this tiny little blip at the very end of the graph. Um, these declines in the intensity and frequency of conflict also coincide with really quite dramatic reductions in homicidal violence, especially as we've seen in industrialized countries. And I think Manuel uh, released a press release yesterday that was, appeared in the news today, which talked about a 40% drop in homicidal violence around the world over the last 40 years. Um, we're not exactly sure why that's happened, um, though we think that civilizing, uh, oops, this is, uh, okay, this should be a different slide. There we go, it should be this slide. We're not entirely sure why this has happened, um, but we think it has something to do with civilizing impulses, new norms, or condoning, uh, not condoning you know, violence, rising prosperity, greater governance, and other factors. But the picture isn't all positive. We have the twin challenges still of conflict and criminal violence that are still with us. Over the last few decades, there's been a shift 
uh, in the locus of, of collective and interpersonal violence, with some parts of the world more affected than others. Studies that I've been involved in for the last couple of years, uh, including the global burden of armed violence, um, has showed that about 10 times more people are dying outside of war zones than inside them. To put a number on that, over 500,000 people, we estimate, WHO says it's 490, UNODC says it's 525, over 500,000 people are dying from homicide uh, every year. Um, about 55 to 60,000 people are dying violently as a result of war in conflicts. And it's not just this distribution, the skewed distribution in terms of how people are dying, it's also where they're dying. Although we've seen these quite dramatic declines globally, actually violence is still very high and in some cases accelerating in parts of Latin America, Africa, and the Middle East. Um, Central American uh, countries and cities are the most violent of all. In fact, 40 of the most the top 50 most violent cities, as measured by lethal violence, are in Latin America uh, and the Caribbean. Uh, this is per 100,000. Sorry. The scale should be inversed. The scale should be inversed. Thank you. I would like to say that's a function of the PowerPoint, but it's probably a... <laughs> that's right. Um, for some reason, this... Has, got, has been bounced around. So let me, I think this is what I want to be showing. The second megatrend relates to the rapid pace of change in the planet's topography. Uh, the physical map of the world is transforming and there's been a massive shift of populations, a, a, a genuinely unprecedented shift of populations to cities in the last half of this century, this last century. And you all know the statistics, so I'm not going to rattle them off, except to say that we know that today over 50% of the population uh, of the world lives in cities. Uh, there are currently about 7 billion people, it will be 9.6 billion by 2050. Um, and while we're going urban globally, while the majority of the world is going urban, most of this growth in the future, over the next 50 years, will be in the Middle East, where currently 60% of the population is urban, in Africa, where it's just 37% that live in cities, and Asia, where it's about 30%. North America and Latin America are already at 80%, and, and Europe is also at about 75%. And there's nothing even or equitable about this growth. By 2030, about half of the world's 5 billion people living in cities are going to be living in slums. This amounts to about 2.2 billion people. And a key point I want to mention, it's not the size of the city that necessarily matters. I mean, Tokyo is one of the largest metropolises in the world with 38 million people. It's actually the speed of the urbanization that's, that, that seems to be triggering viol urban violence. Most megacities, the biggest cities over 10 million people, are actually quite safe. It's the intermediate-sized cities. Uh, this, the, the large and intermediate sized cities that seem to be uh, most susceptible to growing parts of violence. And this pace of population growth boggles the mind. I mean, if you look at Dhaka or Lagos or, or Kinshasa today, they're 40 times larger than they were in 1950. It took New York City about 150 years to get to 8 million people. So alongside the shifts in geography and topography uh, is the third uh, megatrend, which is demography, and I'm specifically referring here to the demographic, the so-called youth bulge in many parts of the South. We talked a little bit about declining fertility and family planning, and I think that point was made really well this morning about the importance of this. So the youth bulge actually is, is in part a good news story. It has to do with actually declining CMR, uh, child mortality rates. But it's actually something we need to watch. The youth bulge is actually statistically associated with a rise in violence in some parts of the world. What it means, and I think all of you know about it, is that the share of the population in the, popula of the 15 to 25 year old bracket tends to be much higher in poorer cities than in rich ones. And in many fragile cities, cities that have extreme rates of, of, of violence and, and, and um, high rates of inequality and poverty, you have situations where upwards 75% of the population is under the age of 30. So the average, me the mean age of a Mogadishu resident is about 16. In Dhaka, it's about the same. Uh, in Dili, about the same. If you go to, say, Tokyo, it's about 45, 46. In Vienna, it's about 45. So you get the idea. The expansion of this bulge isn't going to go away, in spite of uh, you know, advances in family planning and, and controlling fertility. It's going to persist for the, next, for the foreseeable future. And most of these young people, owing to the search for opportunity, for leisure, for boredom, uh, or the flight from violence, are congregating in cities. And the story gets much worse, right? It's not just being young. That's a problem, and, and high concentrations of young people in the population. It's being young, it's being poor, it's being badly or poorly educated, it's being unemployed, and it's being male. All of these factors are, 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 are strongly correlated uh, with higher incidence of violence. Right, this is the proportion of the population under 30. 
I'll, I'll, the fourth mega trend, which is way out of the sphere of this particular conference, but I think it's important because we were told to think big and think outside of the box, uh, is ecology. So where are these fragile cities? And can they maintain this massive population shift, especially of young males? And does their location and vulnerability to various shifts in climate matter when we think about violence? Well, if you follow the trajectories of urban growth over history, you'll see that the man congregates on the coast. And it's coastal development that's not new necessarily, but it's the speed of it that is. Some of the world's fastest growing cities uh, are actually coastal. Lagos is growing at about 4.4%, Dar es Salaam at 4.3%, and we're seeing violence starting to emerge in many of these fast moving coastal cities. So what we're seeing is this convergence of a massive concentration of people in a relatively small and confined geographic area. And when you get land consumption that's at least twice as fast as population growth, what you get is urban sprawl. And what makes matters even worse is that many of these cities are on the front line of climate change especially rising sea level. So take a look at this map uh, and see how populations are bunched up on the coastal areas. Now imagine two thirds of those mega cities uh, disappearing. And this is a reality that many mayors are taking very, very seriously. And finally, uh, the, the sort of fifth big mega trend I think is technology. Uh, we alluded to it this morning. And cities, as you know, are hubs of innovation, of industry, of finance, of connectivity. Cities are where the smart, smart people are gathering and they're becoming more wired than ever before. We're starting to see the rise of so-called smart cities, right? Where big data and remote sensing is being harnessed to better respond to local needs. I've been working a little bit in the last couple of years with IBM, with Microsoft and Google uh, and other companies who are all getting the act of trying to start using this technological, this internet penetration and technology innovation in ways to deal with, with safety and security. In many cities, law enforcement right now is busy harnessing new technologies. Systems like Comstat, which is a computer statistics program that monitors uh, large amounts of data. Domain awareness systems, uh, data fusion centers are spreading across North America, but also parts of Western Europe. We're also seeing it emerge in Latin America, Asia, and Africa. And this is happening really, really quickly. Police are starting to predict right now where crime is going to take place by monitoring public and private cameras, by harnessing social media, by setting up gunshot tracking systems, by tracking license plates, using computer models to predict where crime is going to happen and who's going to commit it. And this raises some really important ethical and social issues, right? But it's not just the cops, it's not just the law enforcement that are getting involved in using technology to try to predict and anticipate crime. Civil society is also getting online. And there's huge experimentation going underway, not just in the North, but in the South, to design new forms of networks, activism, and reporting to deal with people's safety needs. I want you to keep in mind that internet penetration is very high right now in sort of the industrialized world. Virtually all of the future internet penetration is going to take place in the South. And if you think things are a little nuts online right now with 1.5 billion users, wait until it doubles, as it will in the next five to 10 years. And the point about technology is that it's dual-edged, right? It can inspire collective action, including digital protest and revolution. But we're also seeing, and we're working with some groups in the South, in, in Brazil on this, the rise of criminal gangs, cartels, organized crime groups who are going online, and they're using the net to expand their business, to coerce, to intimidate, and recruit. We've actually been tracking gangs in Los Angeles, down to Tijuana, uh, through down to San Salvador, and all the way down to Colombia, who are involved in you know, drug networks and, and human trafficking networks. Um, and we're seeing how it's also having a chilling effect on local governance, as people are becoming less inclined uh, to, to be more visible online. Um, so I think this is a trend that we need to watch. So what, what next? What I've given you is a very quick, very kind of blue sky overview of a, what I think is a very fast-moving situation. There are other trends that clearly matter and will influence the dynamics of fragility in cities over the next 30 to 50 years, not least issues around inequality or governance. But what I've outlined right now is happening right now. And I think the next step for me is to sort of determine what can we do next. I think the first thing that we can do, thinking big and trying to think about big, bold policy conclusions for WHO, is to recognize this problem or this challenge of fragile cities in, in fragile neighborhoods, not just in the South, but also in many cities of the so-called North. A good diagnostic, and I think all of us agree with this, is the first step to defining effective interventions. This is about getting urban priorities into the post-2015 uh, sustainable development goals, but it's also about getting into other fora. One, one way we could start thinking about practically engaging this is twinning cities, twinning our more successful cities with our more fragile ones. There's a long history in Western Europe and North America since the Second World War of bringing cities together to start cooperating, collaborating. Networks like the Global Safer City Network, uh, which is a network of 50 different mayors uh, from the North and South, or the C40 are offering new opportunities for collaboration. Rockefeller has got a 100 uh, Resilient Cities Initiative, which is seeking to put money into cities that are seeking to, you know, innovating around public safety, among other things. 
Uh, the problem is that this debate continues to be dominated, as I said, by developed country cities. Uh, but I think it's a matter of enlightened self-interest that we start thinking about twinning, um, because this problem is not going away. What we can also do is respond to the new topography of cities, making them more open, more inclusive, more integrated. Cities are grow many cities in the South are growing at breakneck speed, exceeding the local carrying capacity. What we need right now are more focused strategies that intentionally bring wealthier and, and poorer areas together, rather than reinforcing segregation and spatial uh, difference. We need to find ways to improve service delivery early, not late, and invest in open spaces. And I think there'll be more discussion about the micro aspects of this with my panelists. Um, infrastructure investment is critical as a violence prevention strategy, especially around mobility. A lot of the most innovative interventions in Latin America these days are seeking to promote mobility between, as I said, high violent areas and high wealth areas to try to create that mixing and that integration between them. The next thing we can do is we can start refining our approaches to violence, and I think this is obvious, to hot spots and hot folks. So focus on cities, but focus on the hot spots in cities. There are literally hundreds of large and intermediate cities confronted with epidemics of everyday violence. But it's concentrated in them. I mean, take the fact that in the United States, five per, well, about 99% of lethal violence in the United States is concentrated in just 5% of street addresses. And this kind of ratio repeats itself throughout many, many countries around the world. There are countless examples, certainly in, in Brazil, where I'm living, uh, in most of the major cities, Sao Paulo, Recife, uh, Rio de Janeiro, um, Belo Horizonte, about how hot spot mapping, hot spot approaches, and focusing on hot people can make a real difference. We also need to get to grips with the demography of cities. Young men, especially young, black, unemployed, and low, lower educated men, are the most likely to be killed and the most likely to be involved in killing. This is not a novel finding. I'm not the one who's saying it. But we need to find ways, as many cities are doing, of breaking that cycle. And I think, you know, looking at the literatures, school, employment, recreation, these are all scientifically proven protective factors. So finding ways to valorize young men in low-income areas rather than stigmatizing them is critical. We also need to deal with these sort of ecological trajectories of urban growth. Again, this is outside of the frame of reference of this particular event, but it's probably the most chilling in terms of its potential effects on instigating different new forms of violence. People are on the move right now, and the coasts are where many have traditionally sought refuge and they're continuing to move. Climate change, we know, is passing this point of no return. This doesn't mean we shouldn't not be working on preventing climate change and minimizing human impact. But it does mean we have to start planning in advance, as many mayors of megacities are currently doing, and build in safeguards, be they everything from water breaks to predictive modeling to new forms of high-rise housing to enlightened coastal zoning management programs, as we're seeing in many cities on the coast. And the final point is, I think, around new technologies. We're seeing an exponential growth of te technological innovation and new opportunities to improve transparency and governance and accountability in our cities. There are examples everywhere of how technologies are improving uh, the ways that citizens interact and the way they network. We've seen some really exciting innovations in predictive analytics uh, and mobile technologies, which hold great promise, but they also have to be treated with a certain measure of caution as we balance the interests of public safety against individual privacy. We definitely need to use technology to focus on hot spots and hot people. Uh, and I think in the future we'll find that smart cities will be safer cities. So I guess I'll end by simply saying the good news, I think, is that fragile cities and urban violence is not inevitable. I mean, I think that we see some very clear megatrends and trajectories, but we've also seen cities that have managed to turn things around and examples, really exciting innovations uh, of where we've seen reversals. Um, and there are smart solutions all around us, and I think it's just a function of starting to invest in them. So I'll hand back to you. Thank you very much.